welcome back to World's True Crime. My name is Brad, and with me is my beautiful fiance, Denise. Hello, everyone. So this week, we are going to be going to France. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be reading it today. Yes, you are. And I have a French last name, but I am not French. You're more English. I'm the yeah. French one. I ended up taking German in high school, so this is going to be a little bit tough for me. And Denise is also French as well, so I mean, she should have read this one. But it wasn't my turn. It wasn't her turn, so no, I'm going to read not. it. <laughs> so if I mess up any names or places, I sue get to me. giggle. Yeah, sue me. <laughs> sue you? Don't sue me. I'm sorry if I do, and yeah. I probably will. You can't just sue anyone around here. Not in Canada. No. But I am sorry if I mess up any names. Which you will. And I definitely will. Okay, so the case we're going to talk about today, his name is Francis Hulum. Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, I just had to make sure. He, You're looking at me. With, like, I was looking at her and I was like, Puppy is that dog right? eyes. <laughs> yeah. He is a French serial killer dubbed as the criminal backpacker. And due to his travels throughout France, he never stayed in one place for very long. No. He was active for nine years between 1984 and 1992. It's a long span. It is. And he is known to have 11 confirmed victims with up to five accomplices helping him in every one of his crimes. You know what? It's hard to find one accomplice, but to find five? I think because of the way he is, which you'll, you're you going to read on. And actually, you've read the story. Yeah, I've read the story. I know the story. So you know that, you know, because of his difficulties, maybe he was able, like, people felt sorry for him or something. I don't know. I don't know. But to help somebody with murder, just some random guy or, mm-hmm. or even a friend, just be like, hey, I'm going to go murder some guy. You want to help me? And to do that five times? Wow. I don't know. People are just eager to murder around yeah, there. Apparently. <laughs> I wish you would have asked me. I would have done it too. No, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so some of his accomplices were charged, but others passed away before they're able to be charged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just so you know. It's kind of weird that people just pass away. Well, I mean, this is what, 1984, 1992? Anything could happen, right? Yeah, that's true. It's a few years ago. Yeah. And, and they were like vagrants and stuff like that. Right. So. They're probably living on the streets, obviously, because right. he was the backpack killer, right? Mm-hmm. So. They probably didn't have stable homes or stuff like that. They're probably vagrants on the streets. I would assume, yeah. Yeah. So Francis was finally captured by a detective called Jean Francis Abgral, who inspired Julian Baptiste, a detective in the hit BBC drama The Missing. I've never seen that. No, but this Jean Francis Abgral is like the hero in this whole story. Oh yeah, I bet you. Well, he captured him, right? He's mm. got to be. Oh, he was like a man on a mission for this. He had other cases, but he was just always going after this one. Yeah, for sure. So, quoted, the man from nowhere is suspected of killing up to 50 men, women, and children, and has accumulated more than 100 years for his crimes. So, he was convicted of, what, 11? And they suspect him of doing up to 50? Yeah, there's no proof of it, though. Yeah, but it's just a lot of people have more suspected than mm-hmm. what they actually did, because mm-hmm. either they don't have any... Um, proof or anything like that or yeah. any evidence but uh i mean they also want to close those cases too so they could be putting lots on him that they don't is not really a factor to him they do but we're going to stick to the 11 yeah for sure so at the age of 32 he was arrested on january 7th 1992 and sentenced to life imprisonment mm-hmm. he was actually sentenced three times oh really yeah wow so francis hulum was born on february 25th 1959 in metz his father, Marcel Hillum, was born in uh, 1934 in Forbach, which borders Germany, and he became an industrial electrician. Mm-hmm. He met Francis's mother at the young age of 18 years old. Young love. Yep. His mother, Nicole Houlion, was born in Lorraine, France, which borders Belgium in 1940. And the two were married on August 1958, and Francis was born the following February. So my calculations is that... It was only six months after they were married that Frances was born. So it's safe to say that she was pregnant on their wedding day. That's very common too, because my mother was pregnant on her wedding day with me. Yeah. Or I was actually, I think I might have been already born. But it, it is what it is. It happens yeah. a lot. My my first marriage, I was five months pregnant. Yeah. Yeah, people don't always follow the whole stereotype. Rule. Yeah, the stereotype. Exactly. Yeah. So at seven years old, Francis said he was sexually assaulted by who? Francis described him as the man who slept in the cabins. Yeah, we, we never find no out. No, we have no idea who this person is. So that could be a figment of his imagination, mm-hmm. or it actually could be somebody. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. 
And at the young age of 13 years old, Francis had what he called his first real relationship with an 18-year-old girl named Patricia. Yeah, that did not last long. No? No. Uh, Probably because he couldn't perform, as one might say. Yeah, I read that he had a medical condition. Yeah, we're going to go into that. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about that Let everyone else know about it, yeah. So his father treated Francis with such disregard, trying to cope with being bullied by other relatives for having a thick German accent. Mm Mm-hmm. So he must have been, like, pretty thick then, eh? He must have been, and I guess they were so anti-German, I would think, to be bullying him all the time. Yeah. But still, I don't think, in reality, we are also led to believe that perhaps the family held him such disregard because of the way he was running his life. As he was an alcoholic, gambling away the family money at horse races, and chasing after women. So, really, is it about his German accent, or maybe he was just a douchebag? Yeah, I'll probably go with the (laughs) latter on that one. If Francis did not bring his alcohol that he requested, he would regularly lock him in the cellar, suspended by a hook and beat him with a belt. Kind of reminds me of like the old days, like in castles, in the dungeons. Okay. You know, the hanging people in the dungeons and... Yeah. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of. Not you? Or it's like something that you do to your sibling who pisses you off. You just hang him off of a coat hook. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah, you would. I'm sure Nicole has scars. Probably. <laughs> so Francis had scars on his arms, legs, and chest from being cut by his father. But he also cut himself to deal with depression towards his uh, anger that his father was treating him. Okay, so he had cuts from his father and he's also cutting himself because of his yes, father. Yes, self-cutting. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. His mother reported that Francis once said, instead of making evil with somebody, I prefer to have evil with me. I think that was the self-cutting. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Marcel was even known to have regular fights and beat his wife, Nicole. He was an all-around douchebag. Yeah, I could see that. Horse racing, gambling, alcoholism. Beating up his wife. Great family life. Yeah. Due to being repeatedly abused, Francis suffered in his school for the development delayed children. So he was kind of like on the... The lower spectrum of development. And even in that kind of school atmosphere where there's extra help, he was still struggling enormously. Okay. So early on, Francis would take stray cats, dogs, and any animals he found and bury them alive. And that's where we go back to the McDonald triad scale, right? Mm -hmm. Like finding young animals and, you know, kittens and stuff like that and killing them. I just find that horrific. Like, Oh, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about these poor animals. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like that, you don't want to see that. Like you've heard of like Luca Magnola, right? The Canadian serial yeah, killer. Yeah. yeah. He did the same thing. Remember that, that documentary, uh, Don't Mess With Cats or whatever? Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember. When he was killing cats on the videos and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Back to the story. Yeah. Get sidetracked again. Even though Francis was abused and tormented by his father, he had a very good relationship with his sister, Christine, and she was six years younger than him. Oh, he adored her. Okay. He was very protective of her and was known to shoo away boys who looked at her. I mean, that's the typical brother. You want that, right? <laughs> yep. At least he's doing something right there. <laughs> exactly. He was known to cover her ears when his parents fought, protecting her from the screams. He sounds like a very sweet brother. At, at an early age, he does that, except for <laughs> killing animals. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we all have our faults. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty big one. <laughs> that is. So Marcel brutalized Francis physically and emotionally until he was 17 years old, which led him to become an alcoholic who attempted suicide multiple times, which we've kind of like touched base on there a little bit. Right. And usually, and a lot of times, not not all the time, but an alcoholic parent sometimes breeds alcoholic children. It's either one spectrum or the other. They're either an alcoholic child or they're so anti-alcoholic that they don't want anything to do with alcohol in their home, around them. They're just 100% the other way. Yeah, so you either go one way, become an alcoholic, or you go the other way where you just stop drinking. Mm-hmm. You either pick you pick your side, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's with a lot of habits, like smokers, drug users. It's what you grow up to. Yeah, I had smoking alcohol in my home, and I end up smoking and mm-hmm. uh, drinking alcohol, you know, but I end up quitting smoking, and I barely drink now, so. Yay. Yeah. It's a good thing. (laughs) So now I'm thinking that his father stopped abusing him at 17 years old because he became a very tall, like, kid. He was very tall. Okay. So now he was probably intimidated by him. So, I mean, 
he doesn't want to like start beating up his son to get his ass kicked, right? <laughs> yeah, I would think so. You know, you got to pick your battles at that point. Yeah, hundred percent. A neighbor said she witnessed him removing artificial flowers from graves at the local cemetery, and they would bring them to her, saying they were for one of her daughters. She stated that as a teen, he had the mentality of a six or seven year old child. It's kind of weird to take artificial flowers from graves. Yeah, to give them to somebody? Mm-hmm. At the age of 20, Francis suddenly picked up a passion for cycling and joined a club for bicycle touring. So he came, like, he, he must have seen, like, um, like the Tour de France Tour de France, stuff. yeah. Yeah, 100%. Oh, I love the Tour de France. I used to watch it all the time. Only for Lance Armstrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> he did still use coping skills by using self-harm to help with his depression and had committed himself to a mental health facility for the first time in 1981, which he continued to go into in and out of for the next 11 years, helping with his addiction. So he tried to help himself. He was definitely trying. He knew that he had problems and he was trying to fix them. Yeah. He held a boundless adoration for his mother, who in 1982 was diagnosed with cancer, and then unfortunately in 1984 died of the disease, and he was only 23 years old. And this destroyed Francis. Oh, it did. This is the turning point. Like, you would think that killing cats and kittens, whatever, burying them. But he hasn't... But but This was it. As a child, I mean, people like to experiment and do things, but, I mean, something needs to break the camel's back, and I think this was it for him. Absolutely. So the same day of the death of his mother, a child named Gregory disappeared. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know anything about that, though. No, but... Francis did start a collection of news articles of the boy's disappearance. So that was kind of weird. Weird, yeah. Uh, When Francis's mother was laid to rest, it was said that six foot five inch Francis had to be literally torn away from the coffin. See, he was a big guy. He's tall, six five. Yeah. See why his dad was intimidated by him. Yeah. He said, I laid down in her coffin in the hole. I wanted to leave with it. Yeah, he wanted to die with his mom. It wasn't long after her death that Francis tried to commit suicide again. So he's done that, tried a few times now, yeah. all failing. His father blamed his son for making a circus of himself with all of his suicide attempts instead of helping through the death of his mother. After the death of their mother, Francis and Christine stayed on leaving in the family home. One night, Marcel stumbled into his daughter's room, and uh, she would have been about 18 at the time, and assaulted her. Mm-hmm. That's sad. Yeah. His reasoning was, due to drinking, he thought that she was his late wife. No, he didn't. No. It was an excuse. It's an excuse, yeah. It wasn't long after Marcel abandoned the family and found a new partner and remarried, leaving his children with nothing in the home to take care of themselves. Yeah, there was no food in the house, nothing. Just up and left. Yep, just abandoned them. Could be embarrassment, too. Oh, I'm sure it was. Oh, yeah. Because once he's sober up from that... <laughs> mm-hmm. So a few months later, Christine got married and left that family home, which left Francis all alone now. Yeah. Okay, so now before we get into the murders, let's first talk about what they discovered about Francis after he was arrested. They discovered that he suffered from Kleinfelter syndrome. Having his syndrome makes you incapable of committing rape in the standard manner. Mm-hmm. So you couldn't really have sex either in the standard manner either. Was no, kind of he like, was impotent. Yeah. So Kleinfelter syndrome is where boys and men are born with an extra X chromosome. Some of the symptoms of the syndrome challenges their feelings of masculinity, abnormal large breasts, less pubic hair, and sexual problems. Yeah. Francis could, however, exert his masculinity via taking the victim's lives after they've been raped. Murder for Francis was the equivalent to rape and taking something of value from the victims, their lives. Yeah. So yeah, he for instead of raping them, he'd rather he just kills them. That's where he gets his pleasure. Exactly. Yeah. It's not uncommon for that. I've heard of this before. Oh, have you? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. See, because you're like the old timer and murder, and I'm the greenhorn that knows absolutely nothing. Well, what I hear is some <laughs> people use knives as penetration of their body. feels like penetration of, of, of rape. See, I, I've heard of somebody using a curling iron, a hot curling iron yep. in a woman, and oh, I just can't imagine that. Okay, so now we're going to get bound to the first murders now. And uh, the first one's going to take place on November 5th, 1984. Hold up now. And we all know what time that is. (laughs) It's movie time. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. 
Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. It's showtime. And showtime it is. And now Denise is going to test me, I guess. I'm not even going to test you. This is such an easy one. I like that. I don't even know how to make it hard for you. This is a movie that we watched recently on our movie nights, our Saturday movie nights. Okay. Um, there's quite a few of them. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to make it harder. Uh, it's November. <laughs> 84. I'm just trying to make it hard by filling in. Um, Assassin. Okay. Do any movies have assassins in it? (laughs) Um, Because if I give you any of the people in it, you're going to know. Let's just go for it. The person disguised themselves to being human, but they were not human. Alien? No, we just watched this movie. We watch a lot of movies. We do. This one's got like four of them. You're really giving me no hints. Really? No. I, okay. Because it's really easy. I need something a little bit more. Okay. Like. <laughs> um, uh, James Cameron produced it. Okay. Or directed it. Jaws? We haven't watched Jaws. Okay. I need more. Bill Paxton? Arnold? Predator? No. Connor? <sighs> <laughs> I didn't think Bill Paxton was in Terminator. I know. That's why I threw it in there. I didn't know why that. He's not. He is. Where? In he, what movie? He's a punk leader. <laughs> I had no idea he was in the Terminator did I. movies. Punk leader. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea he was in it. Oh, yeah. I totally what forgot you... about the Terminator movies. Cause, probably because we just watched them all and they're all deleted from my head now. Oh, they're not of mine because they're good. Yeah. Was that the first one then? Yeah. Okay. First one. I didn't think he was. Bill Pax was in the Terminator. I first. didn't think so either. Wow. Okay, that's why I threw it in there. What was the name of the the main character? Oops. Uh, what the main character? Yeah, not Arnold, but the other guy. Michael Bain. Oh yeah, I would I would never got that. I didn't know his name. Linda Hamilton. Well, if you would have said Little Hamilton. Oh, I know yeah. you would have. If you said what... Arnold Schwarzenegger, Little Linda Hamilton, it was uh, easy yet. Oh, I know. That's why I knew that you were going to get this no matter what. Like, what am I going to say? Disguised as human. The Terminator disguised himself as a human. Machines? I don't know. I know. It was hard. Like, I was trying to make it You're hard. You're trying to make it. You definitely made it harder because you gave me nothing. I know. <laughs> You're welcome for that. Yeah. Actually, I was very confused by it. But you know, looking at everything. Oh, if, it if would've... you gave me the real stuff, I would have got it immediately. The real stuff? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah, if you gave me like the real. The real deal? The stuff that I give you. Because I get hard ones. <laughs> I would have gotten this one. Yeah, eventually. No. Yeah. No, 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 no. I could have said all their names. Anyways, said... November 5th, 1984. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, here we go. On November 5th, 1984, three weeks after his mother's death, Francis performed his first murder alongside his accomplice, Joseph Moulin. Together, they kidnapped a 17-year-old baker's apprentice, Lanel Genest. His naked body was found dumped in a forest in Povenel. It was determined he had been strangled, his throat cut, and he was sexually assaulted. Probably from the accomplice, for sure. Now, obviously, since Francis was unable to perform the sexual assault, it is assumed that Joseph Moulin committed that act. Mm -hmm. Because Francis could not afford the family home, he soon left it and moved in with his grandmother in the village of Vaux. This village wasn't far from Monte Lemez, where he was living at the time. On May 8th, 1986, was the murder of Laurent Bourou, a young military conscript for which Francis was acquitted by the Aziz court of Dordong. During the murder, Francis was accompanied by Dede Jaunty, who at the time of the trial was already sentenced to life in prison for the rape and murder of a young girl named Celine in La Mont du Clair. The court, unable to determine which of the two murderers had actually killed Laurent Baru acquitted them both. So now we're going to move to September 28th, 1986. And at 5.15 p.m., two eight-year-old boys, Cyril Benning and Alexander Beckridge, were playing. The two were cycling along the train track in Monte Lemez. The Mathis family saw them playing, laughing, and hiding. And then there was nothing. 
This was the last time the two were seen alive. Their bicycles, that were always known to have been on the move, now were idle. This is what alerted the parents. Something must have happened, since it was starting to get late. The certainty is, Francis had passed by around there around 5.40 p.m. And at 7.55, the two boys were found dead. The body of Cyril was on a crossbar and Alexander had his pants down. And his underpants are flush with his buttocks. I'm assuming the crossbar is the bridge crossbars? Yeah, probably. Something like that. Because they didn't describe it, they just said crossbars on assuming that it's the bridge or the train yeah, tracks or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. It was later discovered that both children were killed between 515 and 625 and they were both massacred with stones. So that's probably like they're, they got stoned to death, right? Mm-hmm. Their skulls were shattered and their bodies were left on an embankment near the railway line in the town located on the outskirts of Metz. The suspicions were focused on a teenager aged 16 at the time of the events named Patrick Dills. Patrick was a trainee cook who was questioned because he was living on the same street as the victims and he was accused by an anonymous call. Yeah, I didn't get to uh, called it in at all. It's kind of strange that all eyes are pointed at him for an anonymous call. Yeah, exactly. He must have had some other like priors like going on in that neighborhood at the time. Yeah, I have no idea, actually. Although his timetable did not match with the hour of the murder indicated by the coroner, he was released and the case was ongoing. So now we're going to get to the fourth murder. It's on December 29th, 1986. Now the 27-year-old Francis, along with another accomplice, kidnapped a 26-year-old Annick Maurice, who was on her way to work at the supermarket. Her remains were found several months later in the state of decomposition. She had been strangled by her own scarf and suffered head trauma. That's I, sad. Yeah, I think in all of the cases, they bashed their heads. Oh, Actually, really? not in all of them. Okay. Not what I'm thinking. No, I, I, I lied. No, nope. some <laughs> were not. <laughs> okay. So also in 1986, Francis had attempted suicide by jumping off a railway train bridge. But lived. I know, unfortunately, right? Mm-hmm. After that, he finally left his grandmother's home and decided to travel carelessly around France on foot, hitchhiking, cycling, and via train, often without a ticket. Obviously, he's a banker, right? Right. Staying in homeless shelters, psychiatric institutions, and even detox centers. He occasionally found odd jobs as a mason or metal worker and spent his meager earnings on drinking, sometimes mixing alcohol with tranquilizers. That's if you want to get really fucked up. Tranks and drinking? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't know. I don't mix. Yeah, that... I've never taken a tranquilizer, actually. Hmm. Is it the same as my sleeping pills? A little bit more okay. potent, yeah. Okay. Like hey, taking a horse tranquilizer and some oh. alcohol? Ooh, it'll put you out. Okay. <laughs> that would not be a party then, right? No, you would not want to be. You <laughs> want to be alone with that and you're like, you know, and not take a bath or anything like that because you will, you will oh, drown yourself. Oh, my God. I'm learning more and more about you, the more cases we do. (laughs) I know a little bit. It's, this isn't a good thing. Moving on. (laughs) What am I signing myself up for? (laughs) So being abused by his father set Francis up to later take out his anger on the weaker people. Of course. He learned from a young age that you either endure pain from those who are superior to you or give pain to those who are inferior to you. That was the life cycle for Francis. Yep. Hurt the ones that are weak or, you know. You either hurt or be hurt, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So now on February 12th, 1987, investigators arrested a new suspect for the outraging public decency. After confessing, he was eventually also exonerated because of inconsistencies in his testimony. Yeah, he was not actually the person. And now they're going to go back to their other suspect, who is Patrick. Yeah. He was the last remaining suspect investigators had to go back to. Mm Mm-hmm. They believed he was guilty despite the inconsistencies that remained around the timeline of the murder. And we talked about that earlier. Yeah, we did. And the difficulty that a teenager may have had causing the extreme physical violent acts perpetrated on the victims. Right. And the reason why we want to go into the story of Patrick, because he's a huge part of this whole story. And I was like reading up on a lot of it. And he was never mentioned in the story of... Francis. He was like an offshoot of Francis. But to me, he needs to be in there because he ends up going to prison. For Francis's crimes. For Francis's crimes. Yeah. That's why we want to... Which is extremely sad. Right. 
So man we, just lost his life because of the other guy's acts. Right. And we want to make it known that he did this. He was in prison. Mm-hmm. Falsely. Falsely. So and he spent, he did time. We want to add him into this story. A hundred percent. He needs to be, he needs to be known. He, he, yeah. He needs his story told because he was pointed at for so many years as being somebody who was guilty when he was not. Yeah. Like right now on April 30th, 1987, seven months later, Patrick Dills was arrested for the murder of Cyril and Alexander. Yeah. So he was arrested for those two boys murder. That's right. And Even though the timeline didn't, didn't match. Didn't match. He was their only suspect. They wanted to close the case. Yep, exactly. After 36 hours in custody and police interrogation that lasted a few days, Patrick finally admitted to the murders and stated that he didn't know the reasons for the crimes. Remember, Patrick is only 16 years old. Yeah, exactly. He like he said right here, Patrick describes himself as someone who is very bad about himself. I was barely 16 years old and I suffered jeers at school. So he was getting bullied and he's 16 years old. Right. And, and also he, too, you're in an interrogation room for 36 hours. Right. You're, you want to get out of there. So you're going to say whatever they want to hear. To you don't have your parents there. with you. You don't have, like, you're just by yourself. Yeah. They, the, the laws, you can't do that anymore. But back then, I bet you didn't have parents. Well, we don't know the law in France either. No, exactly. He evokes the psychological pressure. He suffered with inspectors who took the turns, who banged their fists on the table. So imagine that you're 16 years old in interrogation room and these They're officers yelling are you. yelling at you, you know, slamming, slamming their, the table. their hands on the table. Like, of course, so you just want it to end. Yep. So this portrayed a very docile and introverted teenager. He believes that he had been betrayed by the adult world. Yep. He was charged with voluntary homicides and sent to the prison of Metz Kulu. He gave a different version to his attorney, but the investigating judge organized a reconstruction on May 7th, 1987, during which time he admitted to the crime. So, I mean, he admitted to it, but that happens a lot. People just want to, like, they want to say something that the investigators want to hear. So they, they say, I did it, just to end it. Because the people, like, 36 hours, you just want to end it. I actually feel very sorry for for, uh, for Patrick. Oh, me too. Like, it's I sad just- what happened to him. I remember when I was 16 years old and if I had somebody yelling at me in this interrogation room, I would just probably cry Yeah, and say whatever they wanted to hear, even though it wasn't true. When you're that young, you do that. Yeah. Moreover, he recognized the rocks which served for the, for the crime. But he was from that area. Yeah, so he probably it's recognized, <laughs> yeah, he recognized the rocks no matter what. Yeah. So that fact convinced the judge of his guilt. Yeah, that one thing. Of huh. course he knows the rocks. Yep. According to his parents, their son didn't realize the importance of the procedure. So he was probably like scared and didn't realize how bad it was actually going to be. Yeah. He thought maybe that if he said what they wanted to hear, he'd just go home. Yeah. But nope. Patrick's parents described Bernard Varlet, who was the inspector of judicial police of Metz and in charge of the investigation as very aggressive and relentless against their son. They just wanted to point fingers and... Like you said, solve the case. Yep. And uh, the judge at the time, Miss Mirley Boubert, appeared to have been at the same view as the investigators. Moubert. Moubert. It's a funny last name. Sorry. I got distracted. <laughs> Moubert. <laughs> Moubert. Well, I mean, it's probably like Maubert or something like that. Like Maubert. But I don't have that French accent, so it's Moubert. <laughs> Get my mom in here. <laughs> yeah. She has a thick French accent. <laughs> When Patrick's parents requested a permit to visit their son, she told them that they would never see him again. That is so sad. Yep. For 16 months, she refused to grant a permit for them to see their son. Then on May 30th, 1987, Patrick wrote to his attorney and modified his declarations and recanted his confession. Mm Mm-hmm. So now we're going to get to... uh, That's only three weeks after it all or two weeks after it all. Yep. He recanted. Yeah. So we're going to go back to Patrick a little bit later. We're sticking to the timeline. We're going to go back to Francis and go back to his uh, murderers. And then we'll get back to Patrick in a bit. Yeah. We'll let everyone know what happens with him. Because right now, this is between... those. This is like after the fourth murder. Right. So this is all happening and Francis is still out there murdering people. He's serving crime for his crime. Exactly. So now we're going to get on to June 22nd, 1988. Francis broke into a home of two elderly women, 86-year-old Georgette Manez and 61-year-old Ghislaine Ponsard in uh, Charleville. I hope I got those names right. Oh, you butchered them. 
I'd probably butch them pretty bad. I'm sorry, everybody. They saw him breaking in. Rather yeah, than they f- actually seen him coming into the home. That's crazy, right? Like, I mean... And you would think, okay, these people... These people see me on to leave. Yeah, I'm going to run away because I, I just got caught. Yeah, but, but no. No, not him. So rather than fleeing the scene, since he was caught in the act, he decided to stab them both. Yep. He had no accomplice this time during the event, so there was no sexual assault. Kind of happy that there was no sexual assault. this because they're say 80, that. They're 80-year-old women. Like, you know, you don't... Yep. They don't need more. They don't need that. They didn't they already, need any they of this. They went through enough. Yeah. yeah. They don't need more. Like, oh, sad. It is very sad. This whole story is sad. Okay. So after those murders, we're going to go back to Patrick now. So on January 27th, 1989, Patrick was sentenced to a life sentence for murder by the Juvel Cordelasses of Moselle for the murder of the two boys. And I totally butchered that, but I don't, I'm don't. i not going to do it again. So it is what it is. I see what you wrote in there. You went and added to it and said asses. Well, that's what, that's yeah, corded asses. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm cracking up. Just asses. That's the easiest in, way to pronounce it. In caps. <laughs> okay, I'm trying, okay? So, yeah, Patrick is now sentenced to life imprisonment for the two boys. Yes. And uh, the court did not take into account that he was a minor, so he nope. did, he was charged as, a, as an adult. And if they did, his life sentence would have been cut in half. Yeah, because he was sentenced to 25 years, the maximum sentence. Mm-hmm. But if he was charged as a minor, probably what? 12 and a half. 12 and a half, yeah. Yep. Yep. And maybe good behavior would be out under 10. Yeah. And it would be good behavior because he's, he wasn't a, a murderer. He's not a criminal. <laughs> yeah. So for the first time since April 1987... Patrick's parents were allowed to see him for only five minutes in a corridor controlled by the policeman. Yeah. Could you imagine not seeing Brayden for such a long time? Oh, I know. I want to see him for five minutes. Like, yeah. oh, that'd be heartbreaking. Victims' parents said that they would have preferred the death penalty for Patrick, but it was abolished in France for minors in 1980, and then it was fully abolished in 1981. So just think, if it wasn't abolished, they would have... He might have given the death penalty. Yeah, you would have gotten oh. it for being innocent. Yep. That's... I, I have no words for that, really. I, can, no. I have nothing to say about that. No, it's just a blessing that it was abolished. There has been a lot of people that have been in prison who have been um, executed who were falsely convicted, and that's why they have the Innocence Project now, and they're doing a great job of freeing some of these people. They that, are. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic project. Yeah. Look into it. Support it. It's awesome. I love it. Oh, for sure. So now on April 5th, 1989, Francis traveled to the south of France. He obtained an accomplice, again, to help kidnap a nine-year-old boy named Joris Viville from a campsite, and they were vacationing from Belgium. Joris was murdered, and 17 days later, his body was found in a bush 12 miles away from the campsite. His body was strangled and stabbed multiple times with a screwdriver. The reason it is known that Francis had an accomplice is because the boy was uh, moved by vehicle for the 12 miles, and Francis did not know how to drive. No. Like everybody said, he did have a mind of a six, seven-year-old, so yeah. it'd be hard for him to drive. Yep. After killing Joris, Francis then went to a psychiatric hospital and told the staff what he had done. Yeah. So he went there, told him that he killed his boy, and yeah. Yeah. and But he considered it as trifles. Yeah. They, as, didn't, they didn't assume that he understood the extent of his crimes. No. They didn't th- he didn't think it was a big deal. No. That probably goes on to his uh, mental, like, mental factor right there, probably. Probably. Francis claimed that the people provoked him by wearing skirts or dresses. The little boy did not wear a dress. No. In reality, killers need little excuse to kill. No, they don't need much. Nope. A piece of clothing, wrong place, wrong time. Um, you have your hair styled a certain way, or you just smile at them. You don't even know that they're a killer, and you just give them a friendly smile, and, oh, you're on the radar. Any yeah. of those things can make you the next victim. Yeah. Like watching the movie Murder by Numbers, they oh. were just, they were trolling, and they just found a random person. Yeah. A killer needs no reason. Not at all. So if they're saying something, it's an excuse. Yep. Uh, since in these type of facilities, people confess to things they haven't done or had happened, they did not take him seriously and did not alert the police. Yeah. Francis wasn't treated and he was released yet again. He admits to killing kids yep. or people. Mm-hmm. They say that, ah, uh, 
you didn't actually do it because we don't believe you. Yeah, we don't believe you. And we're not going to contact anybody or anybody to look into it or nothing. We're just going to say, bye. Because they said that numerous people, you know, say that they've murdered when they haven't. But you still got to look into things and make sure you think, right? Yeah, you definitely do. Okay. So on May 14th, 1989, on a beach in Brest, Francis said he was gripped by a sudden urge to attack a girl. He said, at first, it was a girl coming out of the water. She was about 18 or 20. She had a two-piece bathing costume on. I ran towards her to take her, but I wasn't armed. I had nothing in my hand. However, I had a knife in my pocket, which had a handle made of wood. The girl began screaming and went up to a man who was her father. Two people were walking along a beach in Brest, France, which is on the west side of the country, and came upon a body at 5 p.m. The body was that of 49-year-old Aileen Pear, who was a nurse. Immediately, the police were called and an investigation was started. There's numerous places where it says that she was 44, but when I watched the documentary of the officer who actually caught Francis, they said that she was 49, and I also seen her ID. Okay. So... There was a discrepancy there. Okay. But she is 49. Okay, perfect. I'm glad we got... Uh, yeah. The right info. Yeah. You did really good research. Thank you, babe. <laughs> okay. Jean-Francois Abgral showed up to the scene as soon as he heard about it going through the police station. He found a witness who stated they saw a woman alive and well on the beach. She had mentioned to them that she was going to go sunbathe for a bit. A 14-year-old boy had even asked her the time, and there was a man close by who was listening on the radio. At the time, there were people swimming, windsurfing, and walking along the beach. Yeah, it was busy. Oh, yeah, like bustling. It's, it's a huge, like, um, yeah, a very popular uh, beach. All her belongings were still there. Her purse, car keys, and money. Nothing was touched. Within five minutes of arriving, she had been stabbed in the heart, kidney, and her throat cut. All these wounds were individually fatal. He knew what he was doing. Yep. As it turns out, the man with the radio said he saw two badly dressed and dirty looking men in the area looking at her. Since there was a community of squatters close by to where the body was found, Abgral went to go talk to some of the people there. Obviously, no one wanted to talk to him, but he did find out that a heated argument started when two men left and went into town. Yeah, you don't want to, like, most people who live on the streets, they don't talk to police. No. So I can see why he got nowhere with that. Me too. He decided to check out the homeless shelter close that gave out food and medical help to see if the men went there. It was possible that... He went there to deal with medical issues from being attacked by the woman. Maybe her struggling. Yeah, she probably fought back. She might have got medical attention for sure. Yeah, so might have scratch marks or whatever, so needs to be bandaged up. So, Yeah, so from there, he was able to obtain a list of names, which he shared throughout all the law enforcement agencies in France. On June 29th, 1989, one and a half months later, Abgral finally got some information about the case. A person's name who was uh, registered in the homeless community was among others that were circulating among the police that Abgral wanted to talk to. The police stated that they had arrested a man in his 30s who was traveling without a ticket on trains. And of course, that person was Francis. Francis. When they questioned Francis about the day at the beach and if he had seen anything, his demeanor changed drastically. Guilty much? Yeah. It was obvious that the questions were stressing him out and the answers were almost disjointed. Francis went on telling Abgrel how he tried to commit suicide several times and went on describing how easy it would be to strike certain areas in the body and went on to describe how in military he was taught how to get your victim from behind, stab them in the heart, neck, and then the kidney. Everything that happened to Aileen. Yeah. He had mentioned that he was in the military. It was proven later he was not. No, he was not. That's the the young mind, right? He might have thought he was. He might have thought he was or was just lying But it's easy enough to find out if he's in the military or not. Yeah. Francis also stated that he drank a lot and that brought on compulsive urges. He talked about fantasies he had of killing, but only in combat, of course. See, my drinking brings on a different kind of urge. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We're not going to go there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Until you pass out. (laughs) Yeah, until I pass out. (laughs) Drooling. Yeah. (laughs) Sexy and I know it. Francis quickly turned the tables and said he was 80 miles away from that beach, staying in another facility dealing with his heart. 
When Abgrel contacted the facility, they indeed said he was checked in on the day before the murder and checked out the day after the murder. Convenience. Yeah. They even took his temperature at 5, the same time of the murder. So how can he be in two places at once? Exactly. I have no idea. We're going to find out, though. We will find out. Soon, Abgrel had nothing on Francis. He had to legally let him go. So unfortunate. Yep. Abgrel was very upset since he had felt he had his man Francis, so he traveled to the hospital where Francis said he was to investigate further. This is when he discovered there are two things at that hospital, theory and practice. Mm -hmm. The theory is patients have their temperature taken at five. The practice is that you make your rounds at five. If the patient isn't there, you assume that they had taken their temperature and wrote it down as no temperature. Abel discovered that Francis could have left the room, had committed the murder, and been back before the nurses did their checks. Yeah, so he definitely could have went there, left, did the murder, come back, and nobody would have said otherwise. Nope. And unfortunately, this led it to the ninth murder. Oh, yes. In Roms, in July 18th, 1989, which I probably said that wrong, but it's what I got. (laughs) It's what I got. (laughs) Just two months after murdering Aileen on the beach, Francis beat a 30-year-old bar hostess, Sylvie Rusi, to death after she picked him up hitchhiking. That's why you don't pick up people. No, you don't. The following month, on August 1989, Abgrau was shocked to find out other authorities were searching for Francis as well, when he saw his name on the data bank. Mm-hmm. Francis had been stopped near the scene of a homicide near Emaus Center in Cortizon, a village near Avignon, Almost the same time of the murder. And I'm sorry if I got those names wrong, but I tried. <laughs> sorry. I'm just going to keep saying sorry, Ty. <laughs> I am sorry. I'm just, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm glad you feel my pain. I'm ignorant. I'm ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> I do try. Yeah, I know you are. Okay. Of course, Francis claims that he was in the hospital on Marseille at the time. A body of a man was found battered and beaten by rocks. Again, there was no robbery or reason to kill the man only for the sake of killing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing was stolen. Nope. The authorities decided to go to the east of France to talk to Francis, and Abgral decided to tag along since he too had questions of his own. Oh, he had lots. Oh, I bet he did. Francis was held in a cell for questioning when Abgral asked him if he had anything to say. Now is the time. Francis replied, this is all Gaul's fault. When he asked who was Gaul, he just said, just a Gaul. Just a Gaul. Just a Gaul. This was important to Abgrel since this gave a name to talk about in Aileen's murder. In the end, Gaul was not a person's name, but someone who looked like an ancient Gaul, due to a picture they found from the hostel. No one could find the Gaul who would be the missing link to the question, who killed Aileen? Mm-hmm. Since they had nothing to accuse him of, he was released. Oh, like they keep having him. And I then... know, they get him and then they lose him. Yep. On June 13th, 1990, Abgral contacted a former cook of the Emaus community who recognized the picture of a man who looked just like Gaul, Philippe de Lume, but unfortunately, no one could find him. But as luck would have it, Gaul or Philippe appeared at the police station three days later. Oh, such good news. Yep. He was scared because he witnessed a murder. He mm. said, I will tell you something, you won't believe it. This is a huge quote. Here's a big quote here, okay? This time, I'm going to tell you everything. The guy was really odd. He used to talk to himself. He's a sadist. I was sitting in the bushes just above the beach. Francis arrived in jeans and a white sport shirt. He drank half a bottle of red wine. He was very nervy. We went down over to the rocks to the beach. There was a woman sunbathing there. She was wearing a two-piece swimming costume. He went towards her. I followed at the distance about 10 meters. Francis is behaving like a man. I thought he was going to rape her, so I followed in order to stop him. When the woman saw him coming, she sat up on her towel. She was frightened. She asked him what he wanted. He said, I'm going to fuck you. The woman got up and grabbed him by the shoulders. He grabbed her by the throat. With one hand, he squeezed her throat. I didn't interfere because Francis turned and said to me nastily, Why are you following me? I ran off. I got to the station and got on the first train going in the direction of Paris. That was a long quote. That was a very long quote. Francis's morbid game always consisted of releasing bits of information to police, but not enough to trap himself. So he kind of was a little bit smart for being have a, a it small remind, mind. Remind me of Maqueda. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Maqueda. Yeah, because Maqueda. A little bit here and there. Yeah. 
little bits of crumbs on the trail. Yeah. This occurred in each new case and is evident throughout the course of his dialogues. Abgral went back to Strasbourg to arrest Francis. Meanwhile, Patrick Dills, back to him again, Mm -hmm. his lawyer, filed the first request for review with the Court of uh, Cassation on July 26, 1990, and that request was rejected. Of course. Okay, so now the police have had Francis numerous times, and they've not been able to hold him. Nope. And unfortunately, the murders kept going, which takes us to May 7th, 1991, and Francis once again attacked. This time, he kidnapped a 14-year-old girl named Lawrence Guillaume with the help of her distant cousin, Michelle Guillaume, who he had just met two hours earlier at a fair. Yeah, they didn't even know each other, and they just met up at the fair. Two hours of meeting, and he's like, I'm ready to kill with you. I know. Ah, that's unbelievable to me. In the end, his accomplice gave a detailed account of the murder. Michelle was uh, with his brother at the time of the May Fair and bumped into Lawrence a few times while he's walking through the fair. You know, you're going through the fair and you kind see of like your see, see each other. Yeah. yeah, and then it's like, oh, hey, how are you? And then you kind of go on to like a ride or something. Then you yep. see each other again. Francis, who he had never seen before, came up to them and sat down next to them for about a half an hour. Yep. Lawrence came up to them and said she had to leave or else she would be in trouble with her dad for staying out too late. Mm-hmm. Michelle offered to follow her behind her, lighting the way with his car as she drove her scooter. She I said that yes. weird. Don't scooters have good lights? Depends what kind of scooter you're in, right? I don't I know. Guess what she, so. I don't know what that scooter she could. It could well, be like one of those push ones, for all we know. No, it's like a little moped. Oh yeah, you'd think of yeah, you'd think the lights would be good on it. Yeah. I don't know. I've never driven one. Neither have I. Francis asked to take along and sat in the passenger seat while his brother waited back at the fair. It's so weird because they just met Francis. It's like all of a sudden you drop, or you're jumping into the passenger seat yeah. and going along for a ride. That- Different time back then. <sighs> just strange. While following her, Francis mentioned that uh, she had a nice figure. She's 14. Yeah. Michelle agreed and said he could do things to her. Her That's cousin. A, it's a cousin, I know. Meaning... To make love, because he never had a girl in his life before. Mm -hmm. Francis decided that they should knock her off her scooter with the car, and Michelle agreed. Yep. Wow. So easy, eh? Yep. Lawrence fell into the ditch, and Michelle went out to see if she was okay. She was okay, but curious and uh, slapped Michelle. I don't blame her. Yep. He told her to get into the car, and they drove off. She was upset, so Michelle slapped her, hoping it would quiet her. Oh, that's a, of course that's going to work. It's like a crying baby. What quiets a baby more than, you know, slapping somebody. After 10 or 15 minutes, they stopped at a deserted spot. They then forced her out of the car. She screamed and struggled against them. She yelled and called them mad. Francis then threatened Michelle, either kill her or rape her. So he took down his uh, trousers and tried to penetrate her. He didn't know if he managed to, because obviously it's his first time. Right. As soon as he was finished, Francis shoved him away and took his place and then stabbed her. She screamed in pain. Panicking, Michelle ran to the car and the screaming stopped. Ten minutes later, he came to the car and threatened to kill Michelle if he'd say anything. Michelle was convicted of rape and the involvement of the murder and sentenced to 18 years in prison. Yet, Francis is still on the loose. Yep. Finally... After a nine-year killing spree on January 7th, 1992, Abgral finally was able to catch his man. Francis wasn't surprised that he was caught. His response was, at least you let me have Christmas. That's just, yeah. Abgral asked what he did for Christmas, and his reply was he went to the seaside. It sounds nice, but it's not. Yeah. So after he was arrested, it was discovered that Francis went to Bougaline and killed someone, an elderly man named Jean Remy, on January 5th, 1992, five days before he was caught. Francis befriended Remy and took him to the beach and then killed him. The reason for the killing was because he spoke to Francis about having suicidal thoughts himself ever since the death of his wife. Taking a break from questioning Francis, they brought him to the mess hall that was opposite the office to eat with everybody at 1 p.m. While eating, Francis described what he did to all the victims. I suppose he felt at ease with uh with them, That's what like I'm chatting with a bunch of friends. Mm-hmm. So he's just like, oh, I was gonna let you know, let it all out, right? Yeah, let's all vent to my friends, but no. Yeah, so Abgrel told him that it was best not to talk about it there, since they would have to do it officially later. 
So like you don't want to do it all over again, right? So yeah. Might as well wait to talk about it later. Hold on to the goods. <laughs> yeah. Francis even drew out pictures of times and places of the murders he had performed. They're pretty detailed too. Really? I didn't see them. I, I looked at the pictures and everything and it was so detailed of everything. He would even put a picture like um a spot where witness was. Oh, really? Yeah. Like he had everything wow. detailed. For a slow mind, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. I don't Fra- think he was as slow as people assume he was. Yeah. Francis said, I was a man who had no fear. I had breakdowns. None of this is really my fault. I was sick. My veins would swell up. I would taste blood in my mouth. No one could stop me. I could fight three men. Yeah, okay. So when questioned about Aileen, Francis told the details of her murder. I went up to her with my hands behind my back, holding my knife. When she saw me, she got up. She saw what was going to happen. She saw the knife. I said, my name is Francis. You've got a problem. I want to speak to you. I drunk and you're going to be stabbed. The woman replied, you smell of alcohol. Go away. She said, go, I'll scream. The woman who scared and she screamed. And that's when I had my breakdown. I seized the woman by the throat and stabbed her three or four times with my knife. I stabbed very hard. I felt that my knife against the bone. I was out of control. I heard gulls shouting, but I kept stabbing the woman. I tell you, it was an accident. I didn't mean to hurt any harm. It's all down to the alcohol. It's not ever the alcohol's fault. So due to murdering in multiple places in France, Francis had to be transported to all the various locations and be tried in court. On May 6, 1994, Patrick Dills requested a presidential pardon from Francois Francois? Francois Mitterrand, and he refused him. Mitterrand wrote to the victim's families and assured them that he would never grant clemency to a murderer of children. But he was not a murderer. He was innocent. So now on May 1997, at a criminal court in Kuamper, where Francis is tried for the murder of Aileen Pear, almost four years later, trial began at 9 a.m. The key witness is missing. Gall, Philip Delome, failed to show up in court. It's like he never got the... The, the memo? The memo. <laughs> if he doesn't show up, Francis could get an acquittal. He could be yep. out again. Yep. Francis denied everything, yet Gall witnessed it all. Yep. All the needs for Gall to show up, and they say, I seen it all. If he doesn't show up, he looks guilty. Yeah, then, you know, Gall looks like the guilty one. Yep. Gall, who was, in fact, 350 kilometers away near Laval, staying in a hostel... It's funny because his friends were watching TV and realized that he he was the one that was missing, the key witness, and the police were looking for him. It's like, aren't you supposed to be somewhere else, Yeah, they're like, hey, (laughs) wait a minute. I think they're looking for (laughs) Gull, but he's here. Yeah, so they called the police and got him there. So Gull showed up in court via police car with a motorbike escort after testifying against Francis. And Francis was sentenced to... Life imprisonment with no chance of parole for 22 years, yes. which is not very much. But that's only stage one. For one, yep. So on October 24th, 1997, Agral sent a legal document detailing a conversation he had during the 1992 arrest of Francis. Yeah. In the minutes, Agral wrote, Francis kept us the following statement, saying he had done a bike ride along a railroad track in eastern France had been stones thrown by two children, leaving them, passing by the scene a few minutes later when he saw the bodies of two children near cars and garbage near a bridge, seeing the scene of firefighters and police officers. Abgral immediately conducted research of any unsolved crimes involving two children, but because the case of the two boys were already solved and Patrick was arrested for it, the case was not looked at, since it had been removed from the database. That's right. Fortunate for Patrick. I know, if that was still in the database, then they could piece it together better. Yep. So in 1998, Patrick's parents, who still believe their son was innocent, because he he was, was. (laughs) (laughs) asked two lawyers, Jean-Marc Florand and Karim Ashwi, to reconsider the case. Interested in Francis, they sent a letter to Gendarmerie in Rennes, which is military force. Abgral decided to write the minutes of the legal information on March 27, 1998. Florent filed a new petition for review after learning that the serial killer Francis was near the scene of the crime at the time it took place. Things are coming together now. Yep. At the time of the murder, Francis worked at a business located 400 meters from the crime scene. He acknowledged having been on the site of the day. Yep, he said that he was there. Yep. The time and the exact location of the crimes. Yeah, he acknowledged he was there. 
He said that the kids were throwing stones at him. He's seen them. He was there at the time of their deaths. Like everything was going back to him. Yeah, not Patrick. No. And Patrick's timeline didn't match. And exactly. His did. Francis's did 100%. So on June 21st, 1999, the Board of Review of Criminal Convictions chaired by Henri Legal found that the evidence abducted was totally unknown to the file and can only cast doubt on Patrick Dill's guilt. Right. It concluded that it should order further investigations. As it should. Yep. So Francis was condemned on November 28th, 1999 to 30 years of criminal concealment and Joseph Molin is condemned to 10 years of criminal concealment for complicity of murder. Yep, so he had the 22 years, now another 30 years. Yes, it's starting to stack up against him. And he's not done yet. Francis is now on the radar for the murder of Cyril and Alexander as questions about Patrick's guilt arose, and so they should. Yep. In Francis's eyes, a new conviction would be detrimental to him. He is also afraid that this sentence will make his sister, he cares so much for, disappear forever. There was no real confession to the boys, but he does talk about how he saw the bodies of the two boys. The hearing adjourned and resumed at 2 p.m. with the defense pleadings. Patrick is exonerated due to the fixed time of the death of the children between 5.15 and 6.15. Patrick was proven to not be there at their time of death. Yay. So, yeah, after 15 years in prison, that's 15 years, just yep. putting you guys' head. It's a long time. 15 years. For, mur- for something he never did. He was 16 at the time. Yeah, so this puts him at uh, 31. Something like that. Yeah. Probably, I think there was some waiting time before yeah. he went to prison, though, too. Early 30s, yeah. Yeah, early 30s. So on April 24th, 2002, Patrick Dills was acquitted of the double homicide and recognized as a victim of miscarriage of justice. Yep. The French government gave him 1 million euros for their judicial mistake. I'm just wondering how much 1 million euros is. We had to take a little short break there to look up how much that is because we didn't know. Yeah, it works out to about being over 1.34 million right now. Today, Canadian. Yeah. That's like, what, a couple, you know, 15 years later or so, just over 17, 18 years later. To me, still underpaid for what he's put in. Oh, 15 years of your life. Yep. Yep. This the is, good year's gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's your prime. Yeah. This is one of the most serious judicial mistakes recognized in France. It is the first one concerning a minor sentenced to life imprisonment for murder. Right, because they didn't even recognize him as a minor, which would have got him half. He would have been out... Before the 15 years, for sure. 12 and a half years? Yeah. Even lower, it's good behavior if they had good behavior. And he would have. Yeah, for sure. On December 16th, 2004, Francis was sentenced to an additional 30 years in prison, with no chance of parole for 20 years for the three murders committed in the region of Marne... In 1988 and 1989. Because there's different areas that they were doing the trials. Okay. Remember they're traveling around yep. France and going court to court? Yep. That was still happening. Okay. So after 20 years, Francis is on trial yet again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like his whole life is now a trial. Yeah, he brought it on himself. Yeah. He has already been convicted of nine murders and now they want to add two more to his case. Yep. Rightfully so. With uh, his new trial, the parents of the victims finally had hope to knowing the truth. 70-year-old Gabrielle Benning, Cyril's mother, said, This is the last chance trial. It's up to the judges to tell me who killed my Cyril. Yeah, I'd want to know. Many magistrates considered the trial of Francis was absolutely necessary. Well, yeah, they want to know what happened to the kids. Yeah, and obviously Patrick is innocent, so... Yep. It was said... We all can be sorry for the lack of scientific evidence, but DNA is not the queen of evidence, nor is confession. It's not. Francis has been heard 17 times. He is often varied, even in certain declarations are close to the truth. He has never ceased to vary in his versions. He declared at one point, I say anything so that I'm left alone. Yeah, so that's lying. He takes us into the labyrinth of his thoughts. He is experienced in the exercise of investigation. The accused kept going back and forth in his remarks, remembering and then no longer remembering. These variations are parades. You must not be trapped. Ultimately, we were able to verify the points allowing Francis to be placed in the temporary of his affair. In the end, they are able to place Francis by the track at the time the children were murdered. Francis denied killing the two boys, although it seemed that it was his M.O., 
Yeah, because every time he murdered, he would always check himself into a facility and, you know, the self-help. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, he would always check himself into the facility. So that's what he did all the time. And that's what he did this time as well. He, right after the murder, he checked himself yep. in. Yep. So on May 17th, 2017, Francis was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of the two boys, Cyril Benning and Alexander Beckridge. Upon conviction, his lawyer submitted an appeal. They always appeal. but yeah. They always appeal, but it's, it's null and void. Yeah, but at least the rightful person is in jail for those crimes. Yeah. And is unfortunate that Patrick Dills had to spend 15 years in prison for somebody else's crime. I feel so bad for Patrick. And he was so young at the time, and he spent all those years there. Yeah. We had to say it because that is a cruelty to have that happen. It's like I said, there's so many stories out there, but they don't tell Patrick's side. And his side needs to be known. Yeah. So as for Francis, he's adapted to life in prison. He has no disciplinary incidents in 25 years. He watches TV, eats, has visitations with his sister, and waits. Waits for what? Waits for death. Yeah. He's in prison forever. And rightfully so. He needs to be there. Yep. Yeah. So, so that was quite the story. That's a, yeah, it's a long story and lots going on there. And oh, it, it was a long so story. So sad for Patrick. Like, there's a lot of like sad things in cases, but to have somebody like and to have the authorities get him so, so many, many times. times. Yeah, he was like right there. Like they had him. They had yeah in his grasp, and then they have to let him go because legalities. Yeah, there's numerous like it's hard. It's hard both sides. Like it's, it's frustrating. It's but very you know what? I am so grateful for. Abgirl, he just never stopped. Yeah, exactly. He was relentless in trying to find this person. And I'm glad he did. I'm glad he didn't stop. Like, the rightful... Because he would have kept on going forever. Like, this is the way he is. He just keeps on going, keeps on going. Oh, he was cocky about the whole thing. For having somebody with a lower mentality, he did not seem to have a lower mentality to me. He seemed pretty smart. He seemed like he was on the ball. He Nine years, and he got away with it. Yeah, that's a long time. And even giving out little bits of information. Yep. Well, he brought himself to a psychiatric institute every time and told him what he did. And it's like, oh, we're just going to let you go. I know. I think that. I think that. I think maybe things have. Hopefully it's changed by then. I was just going to say, I hope things have changed. (laughs) Yeah. And if not, if you're listening. Change. Change. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So that's going to do it for this one. Yes. And you're going to love to where we're going next. We're coming back to the homeland, baby. We're coming back to Canada? Coming back to Canada. Oh, okay, cool. Mother Canada. (laughs) That's awesome, eh? (laughs) Yep, we're coming back to Canada for another case because it's been, since our first one, so we want to come back. So number uh, number 19. It's going to be be back to Canada. And yeah, it's going to be a good one. I don't know much about this one, so I want to learn more about it. You're not going to tell me who the name is yet? Uh, Not yet. I'll tell you uh, when uh, we're done here. Okay. I'll let everybody uh, dwell on it for the next week. Oh, I'm curious. Is it like overdone? Is it? No, it's not. No? I, no okay. No, it's not. It's a good okay. one. I looked into it a little bit. Okay. So yeah, we're going to be coming back to Canada. I love coming back to Canada. 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 <laughs> That's where all the gooses and mooses are. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the gooses. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you sound like our son. The gooses and the mooses. <laughs> plural for gooses and mooses. <laughs> Not Mises? Not Mises. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would like to send a shout out to Sam for doing artwork. And yay, she's going to start doing some artwork here. I just need to send her some ideas. And then she's going to take off with it. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Put her own spin on things. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, me too. And if you'd like to reach out to us. World's True Crime at hotmail.com. And I didn't push it throughout the whole episode this time because I probably did enough last time. That was funny, though. It would be nice if everybody could uh, please rate and review us on iTunes and stuff please. like that because that helps us out a lot. If begging helps, I will beg. We just want to keep doing this and have we have fun doing it. Yeah. And we just like the reviews and see what people have to say. I mean, it makes if people don't good. like us, we want to know why. Yeah. Do we talk too much? Do we yeah. not talk enough? Do we rant a little bit too much? I don't know. I don't know. But I'd like to know. <laughs> Do we need to change up our voices? Can't I help there. I talk like this. No. Like a 70s porno star. Is that, no? <laughs> I need well, a mustache. <laughs> mustaching of men. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, you can follow us on Instagram. Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, we have a Twitter account. And yeah. I am 
confused. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Anyways, I think it's time to Let's wrap it up. This has been a longer down. episode, yeah, everybody. It has been. I'm tired. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Just remember, the world's not always as it seems. No, it's not. Bye, everyone. Bye.